I will be reading um, Psalms 108, verse 1 to 5. I have complete confidence, O God. I will sing and praise you. Wake up, my soul. Wake up, my heart, my ire. I will wake up the sun. I will thank you, O Lord, among the nations. I will praise you among the peoples. You, your constant love reaches above the heavens. Your faithfulness touches the skies. Show your greatness in the sky, O God, and your glory over all the earth. Uh, I'm reading 2 Corinthians, uh, chapter 5, verse 14 to 21. We are ruled by the love of Christ. Now that we recognize that one man died for everyone, which means that they all share in his death. He died for all, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but only for him who died and was raised to life for their sake. No longer, then, do we judge any, anyone by human standards. Even, at, even if at one time we judged Christ according to human standards, we no longer do so. Anyone who is joined to Christ is a new being. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is done by God, who through Christ changed us from enemies into his friends and gave us the task of making others his friends also. Our message is that God was making all humans, human beings his friends through Christ. God did not keep an account of their sins, and he, now, and he has given us the message which tells us how he makes them his friends. Here we are, then, speaking for Christ as though God himself were making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf. Let God change you from enemies into his friends. Christ was without sin, but for our sake. God made him share our sin in order that in union with him we might share the, the righteousness of God. Seated. Let's pray. God, we thank you that we can gather here today to draw near to you and to hear your word. May we hear your word today so that we may be changed by it to become more like Jesus. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One more slide. Oh, there it is. Thanks, Dave. So today we're going to be looking and thinking about that Paul's reading from the Second Corinthians. And uh, one of the things we know about Paul and his con contract with the Corinthians that it started on a second missionary journey in, um, in about 52 or 53 AD. He'd gone to Greece and uh, he'd been to Athens and other places. And he finally got to Corinth. And when he was there, he started stay there for about 18 months and he started the church. And um, as you know from the first letter to Corinthians, the book of Corinthians, uh, there was a, they became a sort of problematic church for him. Um, they split into divisions, they had all sorts of immorality going on and deep questions and doubts about the resurrection. Um, but one of the things that happened is that there was a, a, a faction who didn't like Paul anymore. New preachers came in and shared different ways and different thoughts. And they had to transform. They they had to figure out what it means to truly be a Christian person rooted in Christ and based on on Jesus. Uh, and so Paul, as he writes to the Second Corinthians, has he wrote? Sorry, Paul wrote a total of four letters that we are aware of to the Corinthians. Um, and some of them he's telling them, actually, despite all the tension that's between our relationship as, as leader of the church and or founder of the church and those who are ongoing, he doesn't want them to lose heart, to give up faith. And they, they were struggling because of their suffering, their struggles, their divisions, their, their questions about who Jesus was, who Paul was, about what was right, what was wrong. And uh, there's a real danger of losing a, a genuine faith because of the influence of these false teachers that had come in. 
And as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, I'm afraid that your minds will soon be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So Paul was concerned for this church at Corinth that they would um, live out these wrong values, these wrong beliefs that they've been hearing. And some of them were, were through the false teachers who came into the church, but some of them were the, the influence of their previous ideas. And I suppose when all of us become Christians, we, we still carry into our faith a whole bunch of ideas and beliefs that are shaped by the world around us, the society that, that from which we grew up. And so Paul wants us to recognize that we need to base our values and beliefs upon Christ, about who he is and what he's done for us. Someone told a story which I was quite intrigued by about the Antiques Roadshow. And uh, this man had brought along this Omega watch. He knew it was quite famous, quite, quite a well popular watch. But someone had robbed his house and dropped it on the lawn and had gone through his lawnmower. He, he actually found the watch when he mowed, mowed the watch up with his lawnmower and it got mangled up in the lawnmower and it went into the grass, got into the compost. And after it had been through the compost, he found it and pulled it out again. And he took it along to the Antique Roadshow and he was really surprised at this broken watch. It was actually worth about New Zealand $38,000, which is crazy, isn't it, despite all that? So he thought it was a piece of rubbish that was trash. Uh, I think it's the value when it was fixed. That was his, but they thought, I, I think this is rubbish, but actually it's worth something. It's a sense of wrong values. There was some other people who took along a famous vase, and they thought this vase is going to be fun our, our retirement. They thought they were wealthy and going to be good. But when they looked at it, they turned it over, and they saw made in Taiwan on the bottom, and so they realized it wasn't worth anything at all. I think that's the challenge for, for the Corinthians and for us too, is that, that, that we need to have values. Our value system needs to be based on who Christ is and what Christ has done, not on the world around us and the thinking about the world around us. And so Paul and 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, we no longer judge anyone by worldly standards or human standards. Even at one time we judge Christ according to the human standards. We do so no longer. So Paul's saying there's a value system in the world in which we also have in the church. And which, what, which value system are we using? Do we judge things and people by the world's standards or by our human standards or by what Christ in the Bible says? And Paul wants us to judge our lives based on what Christ says and what, what, who Christ is and what he's done for us. Some of the values of the world is an emphasis on individualism. So you say, what feels right for me? What, what suits me? What, what's in my best interest? And that's the challenge of individualism. And naturalism is saying, well, actually, what's, what does the world say? Can, naturalism says, you know, if science proves it, then I accept it. Um, naturalism says only the natural universe exists. And so it's pretty hard to believe in God or the reality of God or prayer or why worship if you think that actually everything has to be put under a microscope to be proved. And so as naturalism says, it, ex it exists only if it can be studied and explained from a scientific point of view. I don't know how they explain love and things like that. But naturalism also has this old idea, which again is popular amongst uh, agnostics and atheists. There is no ultimate meaning or purpose in the universe. The life is just a chance and you're just, you're just always is. Somebody wrote a book called From the Go to You by Way of the Zoo, which is a great line, isn't it? Somehow or other, human beings evolved out of the sort of the primordial mass. Um, we became animals, and then we developed into humans. And, um, and so that, that book is actually written by a Christian who was trying to conf confront that idea. So actually, we are designed by God. There, there is a divine being who calls us into being, who, who organized, organized our life and shaped, shaped us. Well, this guy Gaylord Simpson, George Gaylord Simpson said, man is the result of purposeless and natural processes that did not have human beings in mind. And it's kind of an interesting idea, isn't it, that, that the, the atheists and, and secular people to say that you're just, an, you're just an element of luck. It's just a pure chance that the humanity exists, that the universe exists, that you exist, that, and you've got no particular purpose. And of course, that's completely wrong according to the scriptures and the Christian worldview. And that's what we want to talk about today. What does Paul say about the Christian worldview, the different value system that he wants us to have? And so one of the things that verse told us is that sometimes we had a, a worldly or wrong view, worldly view of Jesus. And so a, a wrong or worldly wrong view of Jesus is just a man. He's just a person, just like everyone else. He was born with, he had a father, even though we don't know who he is. Um, 
He just lived an ordinary life, died and stayed buried. And if you listen to lots of people, that's what they think. He was just, just a man. They say he might have been a good teacher. He could tell some great stories. But again, just a man, just a teacher. And then perhaps he was a social reformer, the way he loved people, the way he cared for the children and the orphans. But still just a man, just a social reformer. Whereas in Christianity, we say, actually, he's not just a man, but he's the son of God, that he came from God, that he was the word in the beginning, as it says in John chapter 1, that he was the one who came from God as, as, as to give expression to God's life by becoming God incarnate, God in human form. He's more than a teacher. He did teach, yes, but he's also the saviour. He died on the cross for us. And his death is the means by which we're forgiven. His, de- his resurrection is the means by which we can have eternal life. And so we say he's not just the, the man, but he's the son of God, the saviour. And not just the reformer, but the messiah. So the messiah was the one who, who does two things primarily. He was one who fulfills the promises to David, a king in the line of David who would restore and re- renew the nation of Israel and all who trust in him. But also he was the anointed one, the one filled with the spirit who gives the spirit to others. So the messiah of the word Christ or messiah literally means the anointed one. The one who's filled with God, empowered by God, saved, doing the work of God to rescue us, the Son of God, helping us to be the part of the family of God through his role there. So this is the worldly point of view versus the Christian point of view. And you see the contrasts and views, isn't it? So Christians, we believe that there is a God who loves us, and this, this has to affect the way that we live, the way we share our lives. Well, what about Christians? So the Bible tells us that we, should, we have a, a worldly view of, of Christ. It also talks about how we have a worldly view of ourselves. So I've said humans are just the accident of evolution for the worldly view of Christ. Our values and our wealth, our beauty, our success. And this is true, isn't it? When we look at people and say, well, they're, 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 they're important because they're wealthy. They're important because they're beautiful. They're important because they, they're successful. Or they can help me to become beautiful, successful, and wealthy. And again, there's no purpose. Uh, Richard Dawkins had this wonderful book, The Selfish Gene, which basically said the idea is that basically your, your, your reason on earth is just for your species to, to survive, to so pass on your genes. If you do that, you're a success. If you don't, well, sorry about that. And that's not about you, it's about humanity. But that's the world of view of Christians, if you listen to some people. And you can see why society is full of you know, people who are just interested in living for the moment, who have no sense of purpose or, or, or sense of passion for the world. Because it's all about themselves, there's no purpose or meaning for it. So what you do doesn't make a difference. And um, you see why so many people are depressed and lonely as well. It's all about them. It's, and they're, they're not important, they're just this accident of evolution. Whereas Christians, we say, well, actually, well, Jesus was, was the child of God. He also allows us to become children of God, as the kids said in their little play, you know, that when we believe in Jesus, when we receive Jesus, he gives us the right to become the children of God. As 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, we're a new creation in Christ. That means we're, we're, we're someone of worth and dignity and value. We're, we're, we're made one with Christ. We're made new. We're, we're a new creation. And ultimately, we have a purpose, which is to be an agent of reconciliation. And so, again, that's, that's the great theme of, of the Christian Bible, is that our lives have meaning and significance, not just because we're in relationship with God, the Creator, or we're in relationship with one another as the family of God, but because God calls us to be his agents of reconciliation in the world. And so, therefore, the view of Christians about people is so much more significant and meaningful, I think, than the world's view of, of us. So I think that to summarise what it says there is that actually as Christians we are, are new beings. When we've joined ourselves with Christ, it means we've died. So again, going back to that idea of 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that we're new creations. You see that actually there's, there's a death. Our old self, our old values, our old being died. And we share in his death. And that's good because, because the old self might have been due for punishment. But when Christ died on the cross, we no longer can be punished because we've died to our past, died to our sin, and we're free from that to live the life that Christ wants us. Verse 15, it says, Those who live should no longer live for themselves, but only for Christ who died and was raised to life. So again, there's this sense of purpose. Now we live not for no reason, but to live for Christ who has called us himself. United with Christ, uh, we live for him who was raised for our sake. And of course, that's summarised in that wonderful verse in verse 17. To anyone who's joined to Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. 
Paul in Galatians 2.20 puts it a similar way. He says, It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. The life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. This is the life that we now lead. Live is this life of meaning, of connection with God, connection with the brothers and sisters in the family of church, and a life of God being God's agent, and of reconciliation and hope in the world, declaring God's love and word and action to the world around us. This is our purpose, this is our mission in life, is that to live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. So chapter verse 18 in our Bible reading says this about our new purpose. We're new creations with a new purpose. All this is done by God who through Christ has changed us from enemies into his friends. I think the uh, NIV has reconciled us and he gave us the task of making others his friends also. So there's the great purpose of the church, isn't it? It's not just to live for ourselves or to live for our pleasures or to live um, for any other reason other than, than, than to be God's agents in the world. And particularly as agents of reconciliation, bringing hope to the world around us helping others to know that there's a God who loves them, who wants to help them to become new creations, who wants to help them to, to experience that their life is meaning and significance. They're not just ooze or, or, or genetic blob that have evolved out of the primordial soup. So there's God's new purpose for us. So it's not individualism. It's not something that we, we face to ourselves, but rather we're, the church is a family on a mission together. This is our new purpose. This is what we've been talking about for the last few years. We're talking about being a family, about living together and sharing together and caring for each other as a family. And one of the Sundays, two or three weeks ago, we got you to fill out what would church look like if we were a family together. And the, there were some amazing answers that you put together. It would look like caring and connection and, and, and truly sharing our lives together. But someone said that, also brought, that would be a beautiful thing and it would be an attractive thing as people share together and as, as they discover the beauty. And people would want to join a family like that if we, when we genuinely care. Not only because, because of the, the way we live and the way we love, but also because we're engaged with God in this mission of being, bringing hope and reconciliation to others. We're not just inward looking, but we're a family together and outward looking as well. This is a church mission statement. So ultimately the question is, what does that mean? How do we think of others if we follow this, this teaching that Paul's got here? Well, again, the world says their excellence of evolution, their values and their wealth, success or beauty, no purpose. But as Christians, we say, actually, your neighbour that we've been talking about, the neighbour that you love, the neighbour that you're praying for, the neighbour that you're trying to share your story with, they're loved by God, and our starting point has to be that. They're the one for whom Christ has died. And so God gave his life, not just for us, but for everybody. And so we need to bear this in mind as we think of our neighbours. And also, they are potential agents of reconciliation. The joy of the church is not that we, we get to have this privilege and honour of having a purpose and a destiny, but rather God has called us all to, to reach out so that everyone else can join in this task of reconciling the world and seeing the world renewed. So the ultimate aim of this project of God is not just that we have a church full of people, but that the whole world will be renewed in our relationships with God, with each other, with the universe itself so that we become God's agents of reconciliation, bringing hope and peace to the world. So one of the things that Paul was confronted as he, as, as he was writing this letter, I think, is that he was challenged about giving up. Giving up his faith, maybe, not so much, but, but give up trying to reconcile with this church. He'd been talking about all his difficulties in chapter 4, the struggles and the pains he'd gone through. He talked about the, the pain of his relationship with the church and think, why carry on? Why not just give up? And one of the things he says in the, I think it's verse 14, not verse 18 up there, uh, somewhere rather. But it says, the love of Christ compels us. And that's, that's the great theme of this passage, I think, is that there is Christians, we're motivated by our beliefs, yes, but actually more than that, the love of Christ compels us. The idea of being compelled is this idea that you're carried on. Have you ever been in a, in a, going to a rugby game or, or, or the show or some other concert where you have to sort of line up and as you get focused on the doorway, there's kind of a squeeze and you have to squeeze through the doorway and, and it goes, flows through? And this is kind of the idea is that, that, that as Christians, the love of Christ, Christ is what's supposed to capture us and it's like a strong wind or a strong movement that leads us and sometimes you can't 
control where you want to go in a crowd like that. You have to follow along with the, where the crowd's driving you. And Paul says this, this idea that, that actually as Christians, we need to be led where the love of Christ compels us. And the love of Christ compels us to know God, to, to love our neighbour as ourselves, to be agents of reconciliation. So Paul wants us to know that the love of Christ is the, is the controlling, compelling uh, influence in our lives, about the way we treat others, the way we see ourselves, the way we see God, the way we see others. It's all because of the love of Christ. And so he, the other thing we do is, is we, we don't give up because of one thing, the love of Christ. We don't give up this mission of being reaching out to God and to others because Paul says actually God is speaking through us. As we speak, we are speaking as agents of God's people. So Paul says this, here we are speaking for Christ as though God himself was making his appeal through us. We plead you on Christ's behalf, let God change you from enemies into his friends. What a great line, isn't it? That we, we, the God has given us this, this challenge. We, we plead on Christ's behalf. That let God change you from enemies into his friends. So if, you, if you've never trusted in Christ or know that you're forgiven or know that you have an eternal home, this verse says it's my job and your job to plead with one another that we would become God's friends and not his enemies by joining with him and being his, his people, knowing his love, becoming new creations, and experiencing what it is to live for Christ and be his agents in, in the world around us. And what a, what a wonderful challenge and yet also opportunity it is to speak on God's behalf to people, to, to, to invite them to become God's friends. And that's a challenge for the church, is it? To do this not just as individuals, but to, to do it together as a family and mission together. You know, reminding this, as I've always, always said, that God's purpose is not just for our forgiveness or a home in heaven when we die, but rather that we might live for him. So he died that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but only for him who died and was raised to life. So this, this is the invitation, is that when we invite people to, to, to know God, it's not just to find forgiveness and eternal life, but that they might live every day for Christ, shaped and compelled by his love, accepting his, this challenge to live for him, be his agents of hope and reconciliation in the world. So how to let the love of Christ change us? That's the thing, I think. One of the things I think we need to do is to reread and meditate uh, on this passage and what Christ has done for us. If you want to just pick one chapter to think about it, uh, chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians is a great passage because it talks about our eternal hope, about the forgiveness, about the new life, about our destiny. I, was, uh, I looked up how to dye wool. Some of you might be experts at dyeing wool, but if you take some wool and you just dip it in the dye really quickly, it might get a little bit of a surface colour attached to it, but actually it needs to soak in the water for 20 or 30 minutes, and some people say up to a couple of hours that you leave it soaking in the dye and in the solution, and then it literally seeps in to the wool and, and becomes fast in there, so that it doesn't just wash out the first time you want it. And as Christians, if we want to have the value of Christ, that to, to see the world as Christ sees it, we need to allow it to seep into our, into our being. So I want to encourage you to, to read and meditate on 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and allow it to soak truly into your being so that it shapes who you are, it colours the way you think, it colours the way you live. Think about the, the love of Christ and what he's done and why. And then start living as a family on a mission together. I think that's the challenge, is not just to think about it, to meditate on it, to think about the love of Christ, but to allow it to actually shape the way we do it and to have little experiments in trying. I ordered us some books from Mainly Music, and I might, thought you might be interested in them. I've, I've, I've got 20 of them. They're called Try Praying. The idea of the Try Praying book is that you, you, you pray for your neighbour, you pray for your friends that you're trying to lead to Christ and you, that you'd long to see them become a brother or sister. You say, well, why don't you try a little experiment where you actually um, try living as a Christian, try praying and seeing what works. In this little book, there's seven days worth of little, little readings where you say, actually, you, you're facing some challenges. Why don't you try praying? And this is how you do it. And it explains what prayer is. And it tells some stories about people who answered prayer, people who were unexpectedly uh, healed, people who unexpectedly felt the presence of God in the midst of their troubles, people who unexpectedly uh, saw God answer them. And there's, there's some great readings there to help you come to believe in Jesus and to, to, to experience the grace of God. And so th these books cost $2.50 each. I've got 20 of them here. Um, if you'd like to take one, you can, you can have it for free, but if you'd like to give me $2.50, I'd appreciate it. I'll buy another 20. 
and, and give them away. But the idea is that you use it and you lose it. So to use it, it means you read it yourself and say, I'm going to try, pray, I'm going to try allowing Christ to shape the way that I live. I'm going to start praying for my neighbours and friends, the ones that are longing to be reconciled to God. I'm going to be diligent in praying for them, as we've been talking about over these last few months. And I'm going to become a God's agent of reconciliation by actually also not just speaking about my faith, but, but saying, have you, so then have you tried praying? I've got this little booklet. This is what it means by use it and lose it. You actually use it for yourself, but you give it to someone else. Now that's something that a tool that you can, you can find useful, then I'm sure it'll be worth doing as we share the love of God, as we encourage them to say, you can have a different worldview. You can have a worldview where you, where you know that you're loved, a worldview where you know that you've got a purpose, a worldview where you know that God has a plan for your life and that all the things you're going through, God wants to come alongside you and the family of church wants to come alongside you and help you to live the life that God please, God wants, a life where you find support in the grace of God in the midst of our struggles and trials. Let us pray together. We thank you that as Christians we have a new purpose, a destiny. We are your children. We are loved. Your spirit is in us. We are new creations in Christ. We have a new purpose and a destiny to be your agents of hope and reconciliation in the world. Lord, help us not only just to believe that we're Christians and that we should gather for worship, but help us to believe that you have a plan for us, a purpose, a destiny, a mission. Lord, we want to accept your mission to be your agents of hope and reconciliation in the world. So Lord, may we truly be a family on a mission together. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.